Yeah, in this short clip, I want to have a look at the cloning task together with you. Before I realized that uh, some parts of this cloning were really hard to see because the video got stuck. So I decided to um, redo the complete cloning task that you have it in one and then it's a bit easier to follow. So um, the cloning task, as we said, is just a very simplified task in order to show you how in principle cloning works. Of course, today there are more sophisticated cloning strategies, but for you it's only to capture the principles and this cloning task exemplifies how to approach such a thing in order that you can later on um, estimate risks and so on uh, in, for example, transgenic plants. So here we go. The task simply looks like that, um, that we have, um, we want to, design a cloning strategy for the expression of the gene S wird Frühling 1, EWF1 in the expression vector, alles wird gut, PAWG. The sequences of both vector and genomic DNA are fully known. That's something which is for today as uh, always the case, more or less. And the cloning encompasses all steps, including, of course, the selection of transformants. All steps should be described and or sketched and your cloning is performed in your fully equipped institute with 200 employees. Additional information. So we have uh, the ultimate goal is the expression in an animal cell line. We want to express our construct in the animal cell line and the gene is derived of a fungus. And this fungus comes from the spring islands having no entrance, which is a luck for us because we can just take it, uh, which you will hardly find, by the way, <laughs> no, not find. The protein is specifically expressed in the fruiting bodies of the fungus, and you can do whatever you want with PCR. You can synthesize every desired primer, and of course, uh, the principle, if you dis uh, clone something in a designated element, uh, you will destroy it. However, other elements will not uh, there will be not an interference with other elements. And if you clone outside of a designated element, nothing will happen. Of course, these are assumptions. So um, in reality, th things might be different if you have a strong promoter next to an element and so on, things might change. But at th for this cloning, we don't care. We want to keep the things simple. We want to understand the principles first. Okay, so this is the task. Now, how does our... Uh, construct look like. So this is our chromosomal DNA and you see here we have our gene EWF1 um, and on this piece of chromosomal DNA we start counting with plus one just here so that's of course artificial. Uh, this uh, you see the designation of the elements so we have here a eukaryotic promoter it comes from fungi and we have here a terminator Promoter is where the transcription starts and the terminator is where transcription ends. And here we have our plasmid. And at the end, we want to bring our stuff into this plasmid. So here we have, of course, also a eukaryotic uh, promoter. It's an expression plasmid. And we have a terminator. And we have here the tetracycline resistance gene. Origin, so all the elements we, we need are there. Origin and a prokaryotic uh, ampicillin resistant gene and a neomycin phosphotransferase gene, which is for uh, selection in eukaryotic cells. Now, again, we want to do the cloning inside of this vector. And it's very important if you start with such a task, you have several steps. So make it step by step. That's the most important thing. Don't do it all in one, you will make errors. You get a complicated problem simple if you if you break it down in small chunks. That's the very basics of project management. And this is a project cloning. Clone this into that. Um, nevertheless, it's simple. You will see later on if you have solved it once, it's very simple. But at the beginning, people usually start to think of, Ooh, should I use now this? BAMH1, what about this ECOR R1? Uh, do I destroy the origin if I use ECOR R1? Yes, you do, but that's not how you start. You start with the first question. The first question is, can I use the promoter of my chromosomal DNA? In other words, I want to have an expression in an animal cell line. 
is this promoter functional? That's the first question. Because if the response is no, it's not functional, you cannot use this promoter. That's the next step then. So the first question is, can I use it? Now you have to go back to the exercise and there it's written, it's from a fungus. So a fungus, of course, is a eukaryotic cell line. If it would be a prokaryotic cell line, if it would be a bacterium, then it will never work in a eukaryotic cell line, uh, in an animal cell line especially. If it comes from a fungus, it could somehow. In reality, you would not take the risk, but in, in this case, you would say, hmm, it could work. However, you read further, and then you realize that the protein is expressed in the fruiting bodies of the fungus. And this will certainly not work in an animal cell lines because animal cells have no fruiting bodies. This will most likely not even work in another fungal cell line. Yeah? It is expressed specifically in the fruiting body. Of course, for the experts uh, in molecular biology, this is not just you. Uh, an expression is not just uh, encoded on the promoter region. There are enhancer elements and so on. So the regulation of expression is complex, silencing epigenetic effects and so on. However, also usually the promoter is somehow different and therefore you would never ever touch this promoter for this cloning task. So you will go for another promoter. So the first response is, no, I cannot use this promoter. Therefore, you go to the next point. And the next point is you look whether, um, of course, you choose a plasmid which is suitable. So you will go for a plasmid which works as an expression plasmid uh, in a eukaryotic, in an animal cell line. And the good news is that you have decided uh, for the correct plasmid. You have here a CMV promoter, which is a cytomegalovirus promoter, which is a very strong promoter active in virtually all animal cells. So it's a good idea to use this promoter. So therefore, the Promoter one, you can take. Second question is where to go in your expression plasmid. And then you say, I have to use this promoter. So I have to go in between the CMV promoter and the terminator. That's where you have to go. So there are no other alternatives. So in this case, your, um, your way is clear. You need to go in between. And therefore, if you are here, the next thing is, are there elements you cannot destroy inside of this region? Well, there is a tetra tetracycline resistance cassette, which is the prokaryotic antibiotics resistance. And you remember, you need a prokaryotic selection if you go uh, in your E. coli strain to amplify your, uh, your plasmid DNA. And if you would eliminate that, uh, you would have a real problem there. But now the question is, is this really required? And the response is no, because you have still a blood gene, which stands for beta lactamase, and this provides you with an ampicillin resistance, so a resistance against penicillin in more general way. And of course, E. coli, you need ampicillin. So if, you, if this is still intact, you can destroy this one because you have left a selection for prokaryotic cells. Okay, so then we are in this region and therefore we can say, we just look at now, that's the next step, look which enzymes are uh, possible or available, available in this region. And then just list them and you list, I have not one and I have cell one. And that's it. So these are the only enzymes which are for this cloning task possible. And now the next step is you look whether, so this is the next step, list the enzymes. Don't look whether they work or not, just list the enzyme which in, are in your target region. Two enzymes. So we have reduced the complexity already down to two enzymes. We have not even looked at the SPAMH1, SAL, ECO, and so on here at this all these regions. We have just listed these two enzymes. Okay, now we have these enzymes and now we have to check step by step whether it's possible to use these enzymes. Now let's start with not one. So the first thing to do is check whether it's also present on another part of the plasmid. And we just briefly look and this is not the case. Of course, again, there are more sophisticated cloning strategies so you can overcome this, but we want to keep things simple. And of course, it's more simple if you have it just at one position. So there is no other not one side on my plasmid. So check the plasmid. And next is check whether it's inside of your gene of interest you want to clone. And here we don't have a not one and therefore we are fine. The next thing we check is whether the SAL1 
is possible to be used. So also here we don't see a cell one, it's just here. If it would be in the origin, you remember also, and you would kill the origin, that's of course not possible because the origin is required for amplification. Again, we have no problem destroying this prokaryotic antibiotics resistant gene because we have another one. So from this vector, everything is fine. However, if you look in the chromosomal DNA, you see cell one is there. So it's within the chromosomal DNA and therefore we cannot use it. Okay, if we cannot use it, um, we can only use not one, full stop. No other enzyme works. So you see, we have said the first step was we cannot use the chromosomal promoter. Second step was uh, we have to use then the uh, promoter of the plasmid. We look into the region, we are here. Third step was we collect the enzymes which are there, not one cell one. Fourth step was we check what enzyme we can use and we can just use not one. Of course, it's a pity it would be better if we could use both because if you use two different enzymes, you, you remember that it's the cloning is easier because you can always put it in the same direction. This is what we can do here, unfortunately, because we have to use one restriction enzyme. We can only use not one. And now we look at our chromosomal DNA and of course it's not a surprise. Uh, uh, the evolution did not put us not one here and here. So we have, the not one is not there at our chromosomal DNA, we have to integrate it. Again, there are of course different strategies. We use a very simple PCR strategy. Now we need to think of what to amplify. We could of course amplify the complete region starting from plus one to plus 2400, regardless of what restriction sites are there. However, it's not really smart if we um, don't need this promoter to amplify this promoter. It's certainly wiser just to restrict yourself for the gene. Now, how can we do that? How can we amplify that gene? Well, simply with a PCR strategy. So let's go for a PCR strategy. Okay, just to remember, this was our how our chromosomal DNA looked like. We had the genetic background. I, I leave leave out the promoter and the terminator as we don't need it anyhow. And here we had our gene, and of course it went in this direction. And now the question was how to go with a PCR cloning strategy. So you remember, just to put the positions, this was plus 300 and this was plus 2300. And now we wanted to clone um, just this gene. So this is what we, what we wanted to clone, just this gene. So what can we do? We design a PCR primer where the forward primer is located here and the reverse primer is located here. So it's located roundabout at pl position plus 300, roundabout at position plus 2300. So the exact position, of course, depends then on the sequence you use computer programs to do the design. Such a PCR primer usually has a size of around about 20 bases. Yeah? And the DNA polymerase um, always goes from five prime, five prime to three prime. So from this primer, when you start with a DNA polymerase, it goes in this direction. So it starts here at this position. Now at this position, it's important that everything fits, but this position, to be honest, the DNA polymerase doesn't see really. So what you can do at this position, if you have 20 bases, so therefore the primer can bind to the DNA, but at this position you can do in principle whatever you want. So you can put something on which doesn't even bind to the other DNA, which has nothing to do. So what you can do, for example, you can add the sequence. You can add the recognition sequence of not one. And you do the same here. And if you now do a PCR, PCR, what you will have then is you will get the following PCR fragment. Of course, you will get the EW 
F1 gene, so of course it's EWF1 here, you will get the positions of the primers. Of course, it's th this, this sequence is the same as the sequence of your um, uh, chromosomal backbone, and you will have the NOT1 sequence. And there you have this NOT1 recognition side, yeah? NOT1. So this is the sequence of the NOT1 recognition side. And now what you do is simply you make a NOT1 digest. And of course now you purify and so on. Purify, mix, anneal, and ligate. So the next steps are the standard steps and you use of course then your plasmid and you do the same with your plasmid. So here you have your not one side, not one. And of course you do the same with the plasmid. And then the remaining strategy is the normal cloning strategy. Okay, what we have achieved now is that we have amplified our chromosomal DNA, the EWF1 gene, by designing primers at position plus 300 and position plus 2300, adding a not one side. We have cut it, we have purified the fragments, we have done the same cutting here at not one, and we have put it together. So we will have formed our product in this case, and our product is then this vector, we can call it PAWG um, EVF1. Okay, now let's have a look how our final vector looks like. Of course, we have our vector backbone. And I'll leave away the, the other sequences. Maybe I put the promoter. There is the CMV promoter. This is not CW, it's CMV promoter. And we have the terminator. I just put these two elements. Of course, the other elements of the vectors are still present. Then I have here my EWF1 gene. And now the th first thing to do if you do a cloning and have you developed your strategy is make a scheme of your product. So in this case, a new vector we have said is called PAWG EWF1. And now, what about the size of this vector? As you see in the picture, we have cloned from plus 300 to plus 2300. So in other words, we put in a fragment which has a size of 2000. Of course, this is not precise. It depends on exactly the position, but for us, it's now plus 2000. So in other words, the new vector will have a size of 6500 base pairs because we have in addition now our gene inside. Now let's see where the positions of our restriction enzymes are. So the HIN3 side stays the same. So HIN3 is at the same position. This is unchanged. So it, it's still at 700 base pairs. What comes here, I, I kicked out the uh, tet tetracycline resistance gene as we have destroyed it anyhow, so don't get confused, it's gone. So here we have then our NOT1 restriction site, and this is at position 900 base pairs. Of course, this is unchanged because we have put, we have used this NOT1 site to clone our EWF1 gene inside. Now here, of course, we have another NOT1 site now because we have added with NOT1 restriction sites our new gene. So here is also a NOT1 site. And of course, the position here is simply 900 base pairs plus the length of the fragment. In other words, 2,900 base pairs. And you just simply can add now uh, this to all others. So here was the SAL1 side, and the SAL1 side was at 1,050. If you add 2,000, then you end up with 3,050 base pairs. So this is the SAL1 side. If we look now into the gene more carefully, we see that there is another SAL1 side here. And if you look at the chromosomal DNA, you see that this SAL1 side uh, at the position of the chromosomal DNA is at position 1800. As we start at 300, this means it's a distance 
from 1500 to the beginning. So therefore this position is simply 900 base pairs. This is this not one position here plus 1500 base pairs and this is equal to of course 2400 base pairs. So these are now the position of our primer of our restriction sites after we have cloned the EWF inside of our construct. As I always said, it's very important to make such a scheme in order that you are aware how your cloning uh, works, goes, and that you know how to characterize your end product. Because again, remember, this is one product we can have. We can have the same, uh, the gene integrated in the plasmid, but switch to the other direction with the same likelihood as we just cut with one restriction enzyme. We can also have with even a way higher likelihood uh, a, a reclosed vector. So we need to characterize now, we need to screen now the clones for the correct orientation. Well, how can we do that? That's very simple. So have, let's have a look into the plasmid. A possibility we always have is a PCR. So what we could do is we could design whatever primer we want to make a PCR reaction. So what about designing one primer here, for example, and designing one primer here? So if the construct has been integrated in the correct direction and we make a PCR reaction, we will get out a fragment of this size. It's just an estimation that's round about maybe 400 base pairs. Yeah? So this, if, if it's correctly oriented, we will get a fragment first of all. And second, the fragment we can uh, address, it should be 400 base pairs. What happens if this EWF1 is integrated in the wrong direction? So just like do it in the same. So if it's in the other direction, maybe I'm, I draw a new just briefly I draw a new construct. So this is the wrong direction construct. So I put my EWF in the wrong direction here and in this case the first primer uh, for the PCR, oh now I've removed my primers, I just keep them, they were, were here and here. And this was the construct. Yeah. The first primer still is here but the other primer, this one, will now be there in the same direction. So it will no more be a complementary, a reverse primer. It will be a primer in the same direction. And you remember, if you have this as a PCR reaction, you don't get an exponential amplification. You will not see a discrete band in this, in this point. So you will not get a product. So with the wrong direction, you will not get a product. And of course, if you have just the closed plasmid, if you have nothing inside, just one primer will bind and of course then also you will have no product. So will this PCR strategy, you can easily distinguish um, the correct products from the other products. Okay, so we have another option here. So I just put this name away here. Uh, and put it inside, PAWG EWF1, 6,500 base pairs. And now I put aside the wrong product with the wrong, wrong orientation. This was this one. And if I now put the enzymes in this product, you see that HIN3, of course, is the same. Let's just put NOT and SAL. So I have the NOT1 sites are at the same positions. NOT1 is here at 900 base pairs. This other NOT1 is also at um, 2,900 base pairs, so nothing changed. And the SAL1 here is also at 3,050 base pairs. So this nobody can read, even I can't read it. What does it mean even? <laughs> SAL1 is 3050 base pairs. The other SAL1 side is now at a different position because this has changed and now the position of this SAL1 side is, if we look in the, 
if we look in the in the chromosomal DNA, we see that it's at position 1,800, and it's 500 base pairs from the end, which is at 2,300. So in this case, the cell 1 is at position 900 plus 500 is equal to 1,400 base pairs. Again, nobody can read that. 1,400 base pairs. And what we can do now is we can do a so-called analytical digest. So we can do an analytical SAL1 digest. Analytical SAL... Whoever can read that, I can't. Analytical SAL1 digest. Why analytical? Because we don't want to clone anything. We just want to see si fragment sizes. If you digest this construct here, if you digest this construct here, you cut at this cell one position and you cut at this cell one position. So, uh, and then you simply, so you cut twice, so you generate two fragments. And then you simply calculate the fragment length. So you see easily that one cell one position is at 2400 base pairs and the other cell one position is at 3050 base pairs. So the difference in other words is 650 base pairs. So the small fragment is 6,000, 6, uh, no, six, not 6,000, 650 base pairs. This is simply 3050 base pairs minus 2400 base pairs. And the long fragment, this is simply, you take the size of the plasmid, which I rewrite maybe, it's 6,500 base pairs. It's a very complicated calculation. It's then simply 5,850 base pairs. So again, it's simply 6,500 base pairs minus 650 base pairs. For the other plasmid with the wrong orientation, we have the SAL1 side here and we have the SAL1 side here. So in this case, the large fragment is 1,650 base pairs. In other words, it's 3,050 base pairs minus 1,400 base pairs. And the large fragment correspondingly is 6,500 base pairs minus 1,650 base pairs. And of course, in this case, it's simply 4,850 base pairs. And these two fragments, this fragment of 1,650 base pairs and this, this fragment of 650 base pairs are easily distinguishable in an analytical digest using standard agarose gel electrophoresis. Now, what to take when? Of course, uh, you will use a restriction digest if you have your cell one enzyme in the fridge anyhow. You don't need to order another primer. And if you have luck that you have this um, this position, which is not at this, um, that you have this enzyme in a, uh, the restriction side in addition, then you can use it. A PCR you can use always. And if you have, for example, the primers anyhow, then you will go for an e PCR. Okay, so that's it about this cloning task. At the end, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm sure that you are cloning pros now. Uh, I want to, uh, I hope that you will have fun with your cloning future. Um, but again, the intention was not that you're pros. The intention was that you have an idea of how cloning works. And of course, the real cloning, there might be more sophisticated methods and so on today. But in principle, that's it. That's how you do it. You just, uh, at the end, uh, use a genetic engineering to put um, a gene from A to B. This is uh, what you do in molecular biology. And of course, the interesting stuff is not this technique, this fiddling around with the DNA. The interesting thing is what comes out at the end. Okay, thanks again for your attention and have a nice day.